Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Looking at 2020, the Administration's Rural Housing Budget. My name is Shantaria Charleston. I'm with the Housing Assistance Council, and I will be the host and moderator for today's call. If you've not already done so, please ensure that you have access to both the audio and video portion of the webinar. To access the video for today's call, please follow the link on your meeting confirmation email. All participants are in listen-only mode, which means your line is muted. However, we are very interested in your questions as well as your feedback. So to submit a comment or a question during today's presentation, please use the Q&A box located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. It will appear shortly. Um, we will answer as many questions as we can or as time permits today. Um, again, the webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and the PowerPoint will be available on HACS website, www.ruralhome.org, within the next uh, few hours or shortly following the webinar. So there are quite a few names that I uh, recognize today. Um, many of you for, are familiar with HACC, but for those of you that are not familiar with the Housing Assistance Council, a little PSA on HACC. Um, the Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that seeks to strengthen rural communities across America through investment and assistance with affordable housing and community and economic development activities that advance rural prosperity. With the mission to prove housing conditions for the rural poor, HAC places an emphasis on striving to serve the poorest of the poor in the most rural places. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about HAC services or products, or if you have questions or require assistance, please contact with us directly. Our uh, phone numbers and email addresses for the national office as well as the regional uh, contacts are being currently being displayed on the screen. It will be provided as part of the presentation material following the webinar. Also, please mark your calendars and make plans to join us for the following trainings. We have a USDA Section 502 Loan Program Update uh, webinar that's taking place next Wednesday, March 27th. We also invite you to join us for Housing and Services for Rural Veterans, uh, our national symposium that's taking place on April 18th and 19th in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And then we have a Section 502 packaging training that's taking place in Kansas City, Missouri um, over May 7th through 9th. So please join us um, for those events. So again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Looking at 2020, the Administration's Rural Housing Budget. I will go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Um, first up is Samantha Booth. Sam, Sam is HACS new Government Relations Manager, and prior to uh, joining HACS, Sam worked as the Public Policy Director at the Community Development Bankers Association, the National Trade Association for CDFI Banks. She also worked in the U.S. Senate for five years as a legislative staffer for Senators Baucus, Walsh, and Heitkamp. Our second speaker for today is our um, own Leslie Strauss. Leslie is the senior policy analyst. She's responsible for a variety of policy and information activities, including much of HACC's work on rental housing preservation. Leslie began working at HACC in the 90s as uh, the Research and Information Director and has also served as HACC's Communication Director. Leslie holds a JD from the University of Cincinnati College of Law and practiced real estate law in Washington, D.C. before joining HACC. And she also serves on the board of the National Rural Housing Coalition. So at this point, I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to Leslie and Sam. Great. Thank you, Shantaria. Um, Hi, everyone. As Shantaria mentioned, my name is Samantha Booth, and I'm the Housing Assistance Council's new Government Relations Manager. I just started with the office back in January, so I'm looking forward to working with all of you um, in the future at HACC events and such. Um, but I want to thank you all for taking the time today to join us to discuss the administration's fiscal year 2020 budget proposal. Um, and I wanted to start with a really brief overview um, of everyone's favorite topic, the federal budget and appropriations process, uh, just to give us a little bit more context on what we'll be covering today. 
Um, you could say that we are lucky this year um, with the appropriations process for fiscal year 2019 having already been completed. Um, in past years, because of log jams on Capitol Hill, sometimes uh, the appropriation cycles have overlapped to an extent, uh, which makes the process even more difficult to manage. Um, but the first three points on this slide kind of give you an outline of how the process is designed to flow. Um, first, the administration releases a proposed budget um, that demonstrates the White House's priorities for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and by law, the administration is supposed to release their budget in early February. Uh, however, this year that was delayed um, in part because of the recent lengthy government shutdown. Um, so the White House released an overview of their budget uh, last week on March 11th and filled in the rest of the gaps um, with some more detailed numbers on March 18th, just a few days ago. So moving to the second step on this slide, um, the administration's, once the administration's budget is released, uh, it's traditionally the responsibility of the budget committees in both the House and the Senate to draft um, what's called a budget resolution. And a budget resolution sets out guidelines for the congressional budget, but it does not have uh, the force of law. And in recent years, budget resolutions um, have actually basically been functionally replaced with deals that are struck um, at the leadership level in Congress to raise the spending caps mandated by the Budget Control Act, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but House Budget Committee Chairman John Yarmuth estimated um, last week that he sees the chances of bringing a fiscal year 2020 budget resolution to the floor as at best 50-50. And I would go so far as to say that it's probably safe to say that a budget caps deal later in the year that is tied in some way um, to the debt ceiling in the early fall is probably more likely um, than seeing a budget resolution this spring. And I should also mention uh, that while this is kind of all ongoing, these first two steps in the process, uh, each House and Senate office is also internally preparing their own appropriations requests that are based on what constituents and groups in their state or their district have been advocating for. Um, the early spring is, is known on the Hill um, as fly-in season for this reason. And a lot of groups travel to Washington to educate their congressional delegations um, on the programs that they've been using and benefiting from uh, during the early spring months. And moving on to the third step, uh, once the House and Senate have agreed on either a budget resolution or a budget caps deal, um, each appropriations subcommittee is given what's called a 302B allocation which is basically just a top line number that they have to work with uh, when coming up with funding levels um, for their overall bill. So using those 302B parameters, uh, each appropriation subcommittee will draft a bill for their jurisdictional areas, which then has to be voted on. And if there are differences between the House and the Senate bills, uh, those would have to be reconciled in what's called a conference. And if this whole process isn't completed by the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th, then we could see a continuing resolution or a government shutdown, um, as we have seen very frequently in recent years. Um, I was trying to look this up last night, but I believe the last time that all 12 appropriations bills were passed before the end of the fiscal year was maybe 1996. So it's been quite a while since this process was run um, as shown here. And just to provide a little bit of context um, on the budget process this year, the vast majority of federal spending goes towards what are called mandatory programs. Um, so these programs are not subjected to the annual appropriations process. Um, some examples are uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, um, as well as interest on the national debt. Um, however, discretionary programs are programs that do go through the annual appropriations process 
and they're typically divided into defense and non-defense categories. And non-defense discretionary programs, which will include the programs that we're discussing here today, among countless others, um, account for less than 15% of the federal budget. And of that 15%, funding for housing programs is only a very small piece. So we're really talking about a small, small part of the total budget pie. And the administration's uh, budget for non-defense discretionary programs this year looks really similar um, to what we've seen in their fiscal year 2018 and 2019 proposals um, with pretty significant cuts to social safety net programs. Um, some of the top line items that made news after the budget's release were proposed cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, uh, cuts to the SNAP program, and the elimination of public service student loan forgiveness. Um, and there was also $8.6 billion included in the White House's budget for um, a wall on the southern border. Uh, so given the budget, um, I think it's safe to say that low-income advocates believe that these kind of cuts um, and some of the work requirements that the administration also included in their proposal um, would be harmful to our country's most vulnerable communities. And on the other side of that coin, um, the administration uh, justifies these budget cuts as necessary to rein in government spending. And they also feel that um, a, a leaner federal government and more robust involvement from the private sector and also from state and local governments um, would be more efficient in helping address the needs of low-income communities. So as I mentioned earlier, I also wanted to give you just a little bit of background um, on the Budget Control Act and why it is important in this conversation. Uh, the Budget Control Act was passed in 2011 to raise the debt ceiling while also forcing spending cuts. Um, it required a super committee in Congress to develop measures that were supposed to cut $1.2 trillion in federal spending over 10 years. And it also stipulated that if the super committee failed to propose such cuts by the end of 2012, automatic spending cuts would be implemented. And as many of you can probably remember, uh, the super committee did in fact fail to come up with a conclusion. Um, so these automatic cuts were triggered. Uh, the cuts are known as sequestration, or more often today, the budget caps. So in 2013, 2015, and 2018, Congress did enact legislation to raise the budget caps to prevent these cuts from going into effect. Um, so if you asked many fiscal conservatives, they would probably tell you that the Budget Control Act has been unsuccessful in reining in spending since Congress has consistently passed legislation to raise the budget caps. Um, and in this process, advocates for safety net programs have always um, been a special, especially vocal in pushing for parity between defense and non-defense budget cap increases. And I think it's also um, definitely worth mentioning that domestic discretionary spending um, has remained at historic low levels as a percentage of the GDP in recent years. Um, if you'd like a little bit more information on the federal budget process more generally and how the federal budget is broken down, um, I would definitely recommend the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. They have got a lot of great resources on their website and uh, great graphics and that kind of stuff that are easy to digest um, with respect to the federal budget process. And then with that, I will turn it over to Leslie to cover the administration's uh, USDA budget. Thank you, Sam. Uh, before I start, I want to remind everybody about the Q&A box on your screen at the lower right-hand corner. You can just type something in there, and uh, we'll try to answer as we go along. I also want to mention that if you look at the administration's actual budget documents, you will see different numbers for fiscal year 19 than what we're going to show you on our tables in the webinar here. And that's because those were based on the last continuing 
resolution, um, which wasn't the same as the um, amount the amounts finally passed by Congress um, after the budget had started to be developed. So there, some of them happen to be the same, but um, their indication of things like 600 and some thousand dollars for Section 502 direct loans in fiscal 19 is not what the number actually ended up being. So looking at what they proposed for single family and multifamily, we've got separate slides on those, shows you lots of zeros, looks very similar to the administration's budget for the last two years. And as you can see in the columns for the final bills in fiscal 18 and fiscal 19, Congress did not go along with what the administration proposed. And um, eventually, the president ended up signing um, those bills. And remember, this was even before the Democrats took over the House, although it was also uh, before the budget requested eight, what did Sam say, 8.7 billion for the wall or something like that, which could yeah. be a huge sticking point um, at the end of this process. Same thing for multifamily funding. The In both cases, what the administration wants to keep going is the guarantee programs, the 502 guarantee for homeowners and the 538 guarantee for multifamily housing because those don't cost the um, federal government anything. The amount proposed for rental assistance is one point, for almost $1.4 billion. We think that's probably the right amount because they have a better system for um, estimating how much RA is needed to renew all the contracts. But um, they also proposed to rescind $40 million in RA that would be carried over from fiscal 19 to fiscal 20. That carryover has been in there for several years. HUD also has carryover in its rental assistance programs, voucher programs, um, in order to get things started at the beginning of the next year. It's particularly useful when there are continuing resolutions to start the next year because there are lots of rental assistance contracts that are due to be renewed at the very beginning of the fiscal year. So um, that 40 million rescission is not a good idea. They, again, as uh, was done in the last couple budgets, proposed to require tenants receiving rental assistance to pay a $50 monthly minimum rent. It says there would be hardship exemptions uh, modeled on the hardship exemptions that HUD uses, which I hear don't always work the way they should. It would also, this is somewhat more of an administrative thing, combine the rental assistance funding and rural voucher funding into one line item. Um, so if you look at their budget documents, the amount shown for rental assistance is actually um, 32 million higher. It's um, the rental assistance and voucher amounts added together. The, there's the 32 million requested for vouchers. They propose no funding for the MPR, which is the Multifamily Preservation and Revitalization Demonstration Program. That's the main source of money for preserving um, rental housing against um, prepayments, maturing mortgages, and um, rehabilitation needs. The PRLF that I included on here is the Preservation Revolving Loan Fund. As you can see, that hasn't been funded for several years. It was part of the last administration's efforts to provide funding to preserve rental housing, which is um, seriously needed. 
the um, sorry, the budget also does not, this isn't on the slide, the budget also does not provide funding for preservation technical assistance. There is $1 million in the appropriations each for fiscal 18 and fiscal 19 to go to um, mostly nonprofits to provide technical assistance to other nonprofits for um, helping preserve properties. Okay, I'm going to take a slightly closer look at the voucher amount. Remember, this budget asks for $32 million for vouchers, and it separates vouchers out. In the past, they have been combined with NPR so that when voucher funding ran over the appropriated amount, the um, additional money was able to be taken from the NPR account. So the vouchers could be provided to everyone who needed them, even though that means that there was less funding available for NPR. And as you can see, um, the differences between the appropriations column and the used column, used is also millions of dollars in various years. Um, the amount used has been, it's been consistently higher than the amount appropriated um, in some years gap is bigger than others. And the number of vouchers is growing considerably every year. We don't know yet what it will be for fiscal 19, but there are more and more people eligible for vouchers every year. The administration, because it separated, because it separates vouchers from NPR and proposes zero funding for NPR, loses that cushion. So its $30 million would have to account for all the vouchers. There's no additional NPR money that you can pull over and use for the voucher program. Their $30 million also assumes that the cost per voucher, which is based on rental costs, is going to be the same in 2020 as it was in 2018, because 2018 is the last year for which we have numbers. But that's two years difference in rents. And it's pretty clear that rents do not stay the same for two years in a row. I calculated if the cost of, of each voucher goes up by 1.5% from fiscal 18 to 19, and then again from 19 to 20, because that's the about what the inflation rate is, then they would need $32.64 million for the number of vouchers they predict they will need. And if the cost goes up by what has been the average annual increase in annual cost uh, per voucher, uh, which is way higher than 1.5%, they would need $35 million for fiscal 2020. It's also notable that the voucher amount does not include tenants in maturing mortgage properties because vouchers are currently available only for tenants whose um, rental property loans are prepaid. And this is something that Congress really needs to change because more and more uh, rental properties have their mortgages maturing, coming to their natural end of their 30-year or 50-year time period. And more and more tenants are going to be displaced or potentially displaced. And rental assistance goes away when the USDA mortgage goes away because rental assistance is legally tied to the mortgage. So rural vouchers really ought to be available for the tenants in those maturing mortgage properties. Another change that we'd like to see in the, more, in the um, voucher program is that the voucher amounts should be adjusted um, every year as inflation and other changes in rents occur. Currently, the language is written so that your voucher amount is determined when you first get your voucher, and then it never changes, um, which really is not realistic. 
a couple things about staffing. What's the, the slide doesn't talk about what the budget actually says about staffing, but let me say that first. It would decrease rural development. This is not just rural housing, but um, all of rural development staffing by 613 people. So that total rural development staffing would be 3,776 person years or whatever the, um, the measure is. There is a geographical breakdown that shows about 200 positions would be cut in DC and then there would be reductions in field offices in every state ranging from two in the smaller states like Connecticut to 15 in California which obviously is a significantly bigger state and all the states already have fewer staff than they did in for example fiscal 17. Um, because the administration proposes to cancel a bunch of programs, they can say, well, that staffing isn't going to be needed. Um, but we have to be sure that the staffing isn't considered unneeded when we hope Congress doesn't cancel those programs. The staffing at the top of the agency has shifted a little bit. As most of you probably heard or read in the Hack News, we hope, um, Anne Hazlitt, who has been the assistant to the Secretary for Rural Development, uh, moved to the White House Office of Drug Policy, and Joel Baxley, who was the Rural Housing Service Administrator, became the assistant to the Secretary for Rural Development. So the Deputy Administrator for Community Facilities, Rich Davis, um, became the acting administrator for RHS. We heard not too long ago a rumor that they were close to selecting somebody, but um, I haven't seen any notice that that's actually happened and I don't know who they're possibly selecting. The assistant to the secretary for rural development is a position that replaced the undersecretary for rural development. Some of you know there was a dispute about uh, USDA Secretary Purdue's decision to eliminate that undersecretary position. And Congress in the fiscal 19 appropriations bill required them to have an undersecretary for RD, not just an assistant to the secretary for RD. So they will be uh, recreating that position and whoever that is, if it's Joel Baxley or someone else, will need to be confirmed by Congress. And I think that's all I have to say and I will turn it back to Sam to talk about HUD funding. Okay, great. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so just to touch really briefly um, on the administration's HUD budget, there's already a lot of great analysis out there. Um, on the different impacts that this budget would have um, on HUD programs. So I'll just move through it pretty quickly, um, but just some general top lines before we get into what you see on this slide. Um, the budget, the administration's budget would decrease HUD's funding by 16.4% overall. Um, it would also impose work requirements on HUD assisted tenants uh, and would include the administration's April 2018 proposed rent increases. Um, the budget would also finance some improvements to outdated technology, uh, which is something that um, HUD Acting Dep Deputy Secretary and FHA Commissioner Brian Montgomery has mentioned as a significant issue for the agency, uh, especially in the wake of the recent government shutdown. Um, and HUD's budget summary did say that uh, rental assistance would be maintained for all currently assisted tenants. Um, I did see an article yesterday, though, from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities um, that showed some analysis that they had done, which might suggest otherwise. So I'm not quite sure um, how well the numbers line up there. But in this first table, um, you can see that HUD's VASH program um, which serves homeless veterans, was not funded 
um, in the in the administration's budget. However, tribal VASH was, which I believe is consistent with what we saw in the budget uh, last year. And the public housing capital fund was also zeroed out. Um, the public housing capital fund provides funding for uh, maintenance and improvement of public housing buildings. Um, and there was also a significant cut in the uh, public housing operating fund as well, which uh, provides operating funds for PHAs. And here on this slide, we see the two big block grant programs, CDBG and HOME. They are both also zeroed out again this year, which is consistent with what we've seen over the past two years in budgets from the White House. Um, and it's not shown in this table, but both of these programs did receive um, a pretty decent funding increase between fiscal year 2017 and 2018. Um, and overall, I would say that they definitely have a very good level of support on Capitol Hill. And here we can also see that the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative was zeroed out and um, there were smaller cuts to the Indian Housing Block Grant Program, um, Homelessness Assistance, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. And then last but not least on this slide, we see that um, SHOP is once again zeroed out in this proposal. Uh, SHOP is the Sweat Equity Home Ownership Program. Um, we also see smaller cuts to all the other programs on this slide, um, with the exception of Healthy Homes, um, which is a lead hazard control program and other environmental um, abatement that has been really important to Secretary Ben Carson given his medical background, so it makes sense uh, to see the administration proposing a slight increase for that program. And then just to flag a couple HUD programs uh, that are more rural or capacity building focused, um, I already mentioned on the last slide that SHOP was zeroed out in the White House's budget, um, Section 4 and the Rural Capacity Building Program. Section 4 is just a capa general capacity building program, but it does have um, a rural set aside. And then the Rural Capacity Building Program is specifically focused on rural areas. Those were both also eliminated um, in this budget proposal consistent with last year. Um, and it's not listed on this slide, but um, Section 184 Native Home Loan Guarantee was included in the administration's budget um, at $2.5 million. Uh, however, Section 184A, which is uh, the same program but for Native Hawaiians, did not um, receive any new budget authority, and the administration justified that decision um, by citing sufficient balances from previous years to maintain operations, um, which is a justification that they have used in past years um, for not including new funding for both Section 184 and Section 184A. And then just to take a really quick look at some other independent agencies, um, the budget once again eliminates the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, um, most of the CDFI fund programs, um, and a couple regional commissions, um, including the Delta Regional Authority and the Northern Border Regional Commission. Um, however, the Appalachian Regional Commission is maintained um, again this year in the administration's budget at $165 million, which is consistent um, with last year, I believe. And it's not listed on this slide, um, but the National Housing Trust Fund, um, which doesn't show up in either the HUD or USDA budgets because it's funded through an assessment on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, was also zeroed out this year in the budget, which is consistent with previous years as well. 
Okay, great. And then I will turn it back over um, to Shantaria to talk briefly about HAC services. All right. Um, thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Leslie. Um, showing on your screen are a list of the HAC um, services and activities that we have. Of course, through our lending department, we have loans um, and grants. Our grants come under different um, initiatives that we have. That's not part of lending, but that's actually under um, program-specific um, grant initiatives. We also have um, training and technical assistance, or what we like to refer to as capacity building. We have research, or we provide research and information um, and data sources out of our research and information um, division. And our initiatives, as listed, are the uh, the affordable housing for rural veterans. Um, we also have an initiative that addresses uh, the elderly rural as well as homelessness. Um, we have started to focus uh, more heavily on persistent poverty areas um, beyond our special interest areas. And we actually focus um, our, our lending and our loan fund activities focus uh, heavily on self-help. Um, all of this information is accessible via HACS website. Um, again, it's www.ruralhome.org. Once the webinar actually ends today, you will get redirected to HACS website. Um, and from there, you can take a look at the upcoming activities and also explore HACS services and um, initiatives that we offer. But before we end the webinar, let's go ahead and jump into just a few questions that came in while Leslie and Sam were presenting. And also, please, please, please feel free to send in your questions via that Q&A box that's located on the lower half of your screen as you're listening to the questions that came in. So question for both Sam and Leslie is, what are the chances that any of the proposed cuts will actually get enacted? Sam, you want to try that one? Uh, sure. Yeah, that is a good question um, and I think is, is frequently asked um, when administration budgets come out. Um, I think that it's safe to say, especially given what we have seen um, on Capitol Hill in the last two years, that a lot of members of Congress kind of see the administration's budget as something to take a look at and to kind of set a baseline for conversation. But, you know, ultimately Capitol Hill has the say when it comes to appropriations and to the purse strings. And I don't think that there's a huge amount of appetite, especially with the uh, new Democratic majority in, on the House side, um, to be enacting a lot of the cuts to the social safety net side of the budget um, that we that we see coming from the White House. Would you agree with that, Leslie? Yes. Well, that's great because <laughs> that was actually um, the second question that came in. How does the new Democratic majority in the House change the appropriations outlook? And so, Sam, you just addressed that. And so there's actually um, two other questions. Um, third question is, how could the debt ceiling impact this year's appropriations process? Um, that is also a good question and um, is tied up a little bit with what I was um, discussing with respect to the budget resolution and the Budget Control Act and the budget caps. Um, so not to get too into the weeds, but um, we'll be reaching some, some resolution has to be made sometime in the fall, probably late September, near the end of the fiscal year with respect to the debt ceiling. And so there have there have been rumblings that one possibility for the appropriations process this year could be that the Cap Capitol Hill will try to tie a vote on the debt ceiling to um, a vote to raise the budget caps. And I think both sides of the aisle kind of see an opportunity to maybe extract certain concessions from the other side of the aisle um, by tying the budget caps conversation to the debt ceiling. Um, however, that will kind of add another layer of complexity onto the appropriations process this year um, because under ideal circumstances, a budget caps deal will be worked out before the appropriations subcommittees 
start uh, you know, hashing out funding levels in their specific bills because they need to have those 302B allocations that I talked about earlier. Um, so if we kind of kick the can down the road on discussing the budget caps and leave that for the fall when we also have to handle the debt ceiling, the appropriations committees are going to be kind of flying blind for the first half of the year. Um, from what we've heard, it sounds likely that they'll probably just use the fiscal year 2019 numbers as kind of a starting point for discussion, um, but then all of their bills will have to be revisited in September, right before the end of the fiscal year, if a, if a budget caps deal is struck um, tied to the debt ceiling that does not, you know, kind of fit within the parameters that they have been using all year. So they're flying blind a little bit if if they kick the can down the road on the uh, budget caps deal. Thank you, Sam. Um, the last question that has come in is, what is the outlook for disaster recovery funding? Um, let's see. I have some numbers written down over here. Let me grab them. Um, so from what we have heard most recently, um, it seems likely that the Senate is going to take up a bill that was passed in the House um, back, I believe, in late January on disaster relief funding. Um, potentially a Senate vote coming next Tuesday, the 26th. Um, and the House passed bill included, I believe, $1.6 billion um, for CDBG DR funding. Um, and it also included $150 million for uh, rural development community facilities funding. And just to be clear, that's not um, related to the 2020 budget. That's yep. funding that would be available in fiscal 19 pretty much right away. And there's also now a need to add to that for the um, flooding in the Midwest. Yeah, and I believe uh, Secretary Perdue at USDA came out yesterday and said that, uh, that additional funding could be plugged into that bill um, before the Senate votes on it next week to, to address the flooding issues. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any, any uh, additional questions from the audience? All right, so having heard none or seeing no hands raised, um, I'd like to extend a thank you to both Leslie and Sam for the wealth of information shared this afternoon, as well as to each participant for your time and participation during today's webinar. As you close your uh, webinar portal, please be on the lookout for a survey following the webinar. This is your opportunity to tell the Housing Assistance Council um, trainings or any other um, offerings that might be beneficial to you as you go about your work. Um, we ask you to please take a moment to fill those surveys out. Um, with that being said, want to thank everyone again and offer you the 15 minutes back to your day. Um, so please thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone.